friends to this episode of the Penny Prophet. And I would like to talk about something that's in some ways sort of connected with the previous episode concerning the sensible housing program. This is a bit of a variation to it. And I wasn't too certain if I was going to make an episode of this, but the more I thought about it, the more sensible it became. And something else also happened. I don't have any Rush Limbaugh two with by T with me. But something interesting happened with that last order, and that is that the order was late. It normally it takes about uh, two, three, four days from the time the order is placed to actually receive your tea at your doorstep. And this one took almost 10 days. And being the decent sort of person that Rush Limbaugh is, he sent a small package over with a copy of Rush Revere and the Brave Pilgrims, the audio book of his popular book, which is predominantly a children's book. But it does a very good job of putting the exploits of the pilgrims who first came to this country in perspective. And it got me thinking too, even though I'm 56. I enjoyed it, I've listened to it, and even for me something came through. And that is the, the message of how incredibly important independence, liberty, and freedom was to those people who first came to these shores took on the hardships of the difficult winters, having to build everything by scratch and having to deal with the Indians, the Native Americans, at times very prosperously and peacefully, and other times with great difficulty. And how they had done so many things and took so many risks and lost so much, including their loved ones. Many of the early pilgrims perished. But they did this and they felt it was worth it for freedom. And that caused me to think of, I believe, Kentucky Senator Ron Paul's words at the uh, end of his career when he gave his farewell to his peers on Capitol Hill. And then I think he remarked a little bit later on how difficult it is currently to sell the idea of liberty, of independence, and of freedom. It's almost as if this nation and its people have made the mistake of thinking that our wealth and our prosperity and our freedoms can be taken for granted. That the money will never run out and that liberty and independence will always be there, the opportunity for freedom to live in what we used to refer to as America as a free country will always be there, it can be taken for granted. And we're starting to see most recently, especially since about the turn of the century, that these freedoms and certainly our wealth can no longer be taken for granted. You know, friends, like the Patriot Act, there comes a time when we the people in an ever-changing modern world may find it necessary to have to allow an occasional infringement in our liberties and our freedoms. An occasional infringement. I understand the concern of many, especially the libertarians, that it'll eventually go out of control that freedoms and liberties will start disappearing piecemeal at first and then by leaps and bounds later. That's a legitimate concern. And it caused me to look at the situation in such a way that I began to wonder, isn't there a way that we can make compensations for those slight uh, infringements that we allow in the name of responsibility, as I've mentioned before, with every right, whether it's constitutionally guaranteed or not, there comes a responsibility. I believe I mentioned that in our discussion of the Second Amendment, how it may be a good idea, for instance, that our weapons should be registered, we may or may not need to carry a firearm owner's ID card, that perhaps we could present our weapons to the local police department, allow them to fire off around, and keep a ballistic sample for future possible investigations, especially if the gun is lost or stolen, and then later is used in the committing of a crime. But when it comes to freedoms and liberties, and our independence, 
We have to be very careful where, in the name of responsibility, we allow minor infringements. And I wonder, is it possible we could do something that could sort of compensate for what we're doing? Why does the situation have to be that everything else maintains a status quo and the infringements continue and continue and continue to mount, with no compensation coming back? I presume the situation is such that we have a tendency to presuppose that, well, if the infringements get a little too difficult or a little too deep, we can always just vote somebody out of office. But what happens when people in your community vote somebody of a particular party or a particular political ideology that you don't agree with and they continue the attack on our liberties and our freedoms? So I want to talk to you about the possibility of a simple way to regain a freedom that may in some way also cause a group of people in the community to prosper. I call this idea, this suggestion, the Neighbor Street Bank Account. And since I live in Hoffman Estates, Illinois, on Newark Lane, I'd like to use it as an example. The village of Hoffman Estates resides in the county of Cook, Cook County, Illinois. It's a fairly large county. It extends from here going all the way to Lake Michigan, and the city of Chicago is a part of Cook County also. So, as compared to other counties in the state of Illinois, the taxation is a bit higher here. Generally speaking, as a matter of fact, everything's a bit higher here which is kind of interesting because unlike California, we don't have a coastline of beaches. Or unlike Arizona, we don't have a Grand Canyon, we don't have a Niagara Falls. In fact, I believe uh, Illinois was usually referred to as the Great Plains State. It was flat, flat plains, good for grazing animals. May have been good for the Native Americans to be hunting buffalo out in the open, but. There's not a whole lot outside of what man has built in the form of everything from the city of Chicago and its amenities to local shopping malls that is really that appealing of this part of America. It's just flat prairie land. Used to have quite a significant amount of wetlands. The wetlands have been reduced down to only two, three, four percent of what they used to be in the time of Abraham Lincoln. But I think we can use this as a good example of what we're trying to talk about here. We have officially 37 homes on Newark Lane. And as I said earlier, somewhere between 100 and 150 people out of 55,000 live here. Now, in regards to the cost of living above and beyond utilities and groceries and that sort of thing. 
were only concerned with property tax. Now in my parents' home on Newark Lane, where my mother lives, my father passed away 10 years ago, she's paying a little over $2,000 a year property tax. But she's actually quite fortunate. It's what might be called a senior citizen's discount. So her property tax has been frozen to a particular level. And for some reason, even though the house has had some innovations and improvements to it, it is valued at the highest price of all the homes on this eastern leg of Newark Lane, with the exception of the houses that have a second level. Those are the people who live in the other ranch homes. We're not even talking about the second level homes that have been remodeled and improved upon. They're paying most likely at least $3,3200 a year. Some are probably paying $4,000 or more. So I think it's a pretty fair estimate to say that the average home on Newark Lane pays at least $3,000 a year property tax. Now we're talking $3,000 a year times 37 homes. That's $111,000 a year being paid in property tax. But what is Newark Lane, Hoffman Estates, getting for $111,000 a year? Well, you may say, well, you're getting what everybody else gets for the property tax. You have uh, road repairs, you have uh, sewage and water, you have the police department and the fire department, whatever um, amenities the organization of the village, the town hall and its government gives you. But here's something to consider where that's concerned. What is Newark Lane getting for $111,000 a year? Well, we pointed out they're repairing the road, but that's the first time they've really rebuilt the road in 15 to 20 years. As a matter of fact, it's been about 20 years, and I believe the last time they worked on the road, they merely resurfaced it. For them to do what they're doing now is the deluxe treatment. They're completely replacing the road. They did some work to the sewage. Uh, they've replaced the curbs. We have new sidewalks and new aprons, as you had seen, on all the driveways. But they haven't done that kind of a work regarding the sidewalks and the aprons and the curbs for maybe 30 or 40 years. It's only about the second time since my family has lived on Newark Lane, and we were one of the first and probably the last of the original families here. When this community opened, when this street was opened up, and the homes were built in 57 and 58. Well, then you may say, but of course, what about then the police and the fire department? But how often do you need the fire department? How often do you need the police? Especially if you are armed in your home against invaders. Oh, the police drive by and they check traffic. But, of course, we need the police and the fire department. It's not to put them down, but we just don't use them that often, especially in a peaceful community. Actually, in reality, at least half of our property tax bill, at least for my mother's house, goes to a school district located in Palatine, Illinois, which is several miles away. And to the best of my knowledge, no one on Newark Lane ever sent their children to a school in Palatine, Illinois. But getting back to what I mentioned about the police and the fire department, something really struck me. The use, yes, there's a necessity for a police department and a fire department, but the paying of it and the use of it, pretty much like the rest of the village public works for the streets or the sidewalks or the sewer, it's really structured about the same way that an insurance company is structured. You pay whether you need the services or not. When the time comes that you need services, goods or services from the village, from the police department or the fire department, then it is rendered to you basically free of charge because you've been paying premiums in the form of property taxes. In the case of my mother, for 57 years now. In fact, that house, $15,350, cost my parents about $35,000 when they finally paid off the mortgage because of interest on the loan. But now they pay back every seven years the original cost of the home in property tax. 
And this property tax, like an insurance premium, is only a benefit to you when you use it, when you use the police department, when you use the fire department, which is not that often. So this is where the neighbor street bank account comes into play. This is where a section of a large suburban community, because as I said before, it's not like any individual, any single home is going to get to know everybody in a village of 55,000 people. But if you worked with and cooperated with just the people in those 37 homes, 100 to 150 people, that's something you may be able to handle. And you may be able to handle it in the sense of the neighbor street bank account in a way that is beneficial to you, to your neighbors, and in a way that will help offset the checks and balances of those occasional infringements we have to allow on our freedoms and our liberties. A way to get some of that freedom and liberty and independence back. The neighbor street bank account works this way. Imagine the people of Newark Lane paying the current rate of property tax, not to the village, but into a bank account, a Newark Lane bank account, the neighbor's street bank account for the people who live only on Newark Lane. It would grow by $111,000 a year, actually perhaps a little bit more, depending on how the money may be invested. It would be preposterous to put $111,000 into a bank account and not expect any interest of any kind whatsoever. Certainly you would not want to risk the money on some high yield but high risk investments, but there's no reason that any decent financial institution can't grant two, three, four, five percent a year. But that's something to be discussed later. We can't take that for granted. But you may be saying, well, obviously the community is not going to allow you to put your property tax money into a bank account. Well, of course, it'll take some legislation on the part of the individual community. For what Newark Lane could do, so could Nogales, or Newton, or Illinois Boulevard, or Pleasant, or Payson, the streets that cross over uh, Illinois Boulevard. And it's entirely possible for two or more streets to sort of band together, small portions of the community. They're a part of the community, but they have a financial independence. Now you may be saying, well, if this is the case, if you try to do this, and if everybody, if all the streets do it, how is the town hall going to run? How are the public works going to run? Well, I would recommend, and this is the way the suggestion is, is designed to operate, in the case of Newark Lane, and $111,000 minimum, that 10%, $11,000, would be sent to the town hall, to the community. Each street that is engaging in a neighbor street uh, community bank account will send 10% of their funds for public works and to pay the police and the fire departments. But even more so than this, let's say these people on Newark Lane have grouped together and have this bank account, and they need to call the fire department, or they need to call the police department. Then what they would do is they would compensate the police department or the fire department, who would give the street a bill for whatever services were rendered. And of course, it would be part of the fleshing out of the details for the people on each street and within each neighbor street bank account uh, commonwealth to be able to determine what fees are acceptable where fire department and police department help are concerned. If you're calling them simply because there's a suspicious character on the property or in your street and a police car comes by and just looks around and leaves, they can't charge you thousands of dollars for that if there is some major police or fire department work then it may cost thousands but generally speaking and you can probably attest to this how often do you use your police or fire department not very often so those years when you virtually use none of their services at all you keep the money in your bank account you pay 
for goods and services when they are rendered. This is the way it should be. It's the way it is in life. You don't pay for a car unless you buy a car. You don't pay for groceries unless you purchase the groceries. You don't keep sending money to the grocery store, to the local theater, to the gas station. You purchase goods and services when you need them and you pay for them at the time and that's it. But as I mentioned earlier, the village, the police department, the fire department, public works, the local school, they charge you whether you get service from them or not. And what they're charging is enormous, really, for what little you're getting out of the community. And here's something that's even more important. If you're in charge of your property tax, if you on your street are in charge of your property tax, and you're paying for services from the community only when you use them, then here comes something really, really important. The community has no right to evict you from your property if you can no longer afford to pay property taxes. We are supposed to have a right to both obtain and secure property. But if we've purchased a house and the land it resides on, and 10, 15 years later we can't, because of massive economic troubles, pay our property tax, the community, which is basically the politicians at Town Hall, can take your property from you and sell it for a song to regain their tax money at your expense. This is a huge infringement of freedoms and liberties and rights. If you're paying for your own keep as part of the community, but independent also of the community, dependent on yourselves and on those homes and families within your street. No one has the right to kick you off your property. Now, if you can't pay into the neighbor's street bank account, that's something I think you can settle amongst your neighbors. So you're paying your property tax money into a bank account. Everybody on your street is. You have a sense of almost being an independent sovereign state. A little touch of that liberty and independence has come back to you. When you need goods or services from the community, you pay for them. In the meantime, you only apportion 10% of the money coming into the bank account towards the community fund. And it's up to the community to be able to make, make good with that money. After all, there's an awful lot of streets in Hoffman Estates with a population of 55,000. And if these streets in singular streets or groups of two, three, or four, decide to establish a neighbor street bank account, there's a lot of money still coming into town hall at that 10% rate. But what's most important and really beautiful about the program is that, of course, if throughout the course of one year, you haven't used the fire department, you haven't used the police department, you didn't need the roads repaired, there wasn't any maintenance on the sewers, or the waterworks, and also, of course, you're not paying for schools you don't use. You'd think tuition would be enough. Then your bank account is going to grow. In this particular instance, the Newark Lane bank account is going to grow $111,000 a year, not counting interest. So if in the course of 10 years, if expenses have been fairly low. Those expenses with regards to the community, police department, fire department, public works that you've had to pay for have been fairly low. Newark Lane would have over a million dollars in their account, not counting whatever it would have grown in relation to interest on their investments. In 20 years, over two million dollars. Or in 20 years, sufficient amount of money basically to generate through dividends and interest all the money people have been putting in in the form of property tax. So if somebody moves into Newark Lane, they're going to pay whatever the agreed upon level of property tax value goes into their neighbor street bank account. After 20 years, it's very possible they don't have to pay property tax anymore. The bank account provides it. What happens if because of the interest and the earnings on your investment, you have two and a half or three million. 
and you're gaining, oh, perhaps an extra 50 or 60 or $70,000 a year more than you need above and beyond what was being put in for property tax. So everybody on the street, all 37 homes aren't paying property tax anymore. The earnings in the bank account pays for that, pays its 10% to the community and provides you with all this monetary wealth necessary for you to be able to fix your own streets, your own sidewalks, pay for your own use of the fire department or the police department. As long as there is no catastrophic use of the funds or a catastrophic collapse of the funds, after 20 years you will no longer need paid property tax. You'll actually have fifty to $100,000 above and beyond what you were putting in in the form of property tax to do whatever you want with. Now I want you to think about that for a moment because now comes a conversion of the neighbor street bank account. You could now call it not the neighbor street but the neighbor's treat bank account. Let's say of those 37 houses, once a year one family has predominant control of the account. They can't spend whatever they want. They have to report to their neighbors and perhaps once a year the neighbors would get together and talk about business, what's in the account, what the street needs. Now let's just say it's been 20 plus years and uh, we're generating in our account more money than we were putting in in the form of property tax. In fact, we're exceeding it by fifty dollars to $100,000 a year because of interest earnings. Well, what could we do with that fifty dollars to $100,000? What could we do with the $111,000 it generates off of interest before we get to the excess of fifty dollars to $100,000 extra? If we haven't used that money throughout the course of the year for the police department, fire department, public works, etc., imagine if this street of 37 homes had between $100,000 and $200,000 to do what it wanted with. What would you do with it? You don't have to apply your imagination very long. Let's say the Joneses, their, their driveway is in terrible condition. The community pays for a new driveway. You might even be able to pay for everybody's driveway. You might be able to take fifty, sixty thousand 60000 that year and Professionally landscape everybody's home, increasing its value. And even though its value increases, your property tax does not go up because you're not paying property taxes either to the community at large or into the bank account. It's generating its own funds after 20 years. Maybe uh, there's someone in the uh, community who's really hurting. An elderly person needs improvements to their home, such as a ramp because now they're wheelchair bound. The community can give that for them. Families get together in the street, decide yes or no. Sure, invest that five or ten thousand dollars to the Andersons' home. They need the handicapped ramp. They need some facilities incorporated within their home to accommodate Mr. and Mrs. Anderson, who's now com almost completely handicapped. Maybe you could decide, uh, hey, to get the whole block together, the whole street together, we're going to spend a week to 10 days in Hawaii, all paid by the neighbor's treat bank account. Or maybe this year we're going down to Miami to see the Super Bowl. If something does happen catastrophic, the fund is there to compensate for it. Anything you can think of that you would want to do for yourself, not so much for yourself, but either for yourself or for your neighbors or for the entire street or for how many streets are invested in that particular neighbor street bank account. Whatever you want to come up with. Christmas party, Halloween party. What happens if, for instance, the Destiny Church were to fold? The community could purchase the structure, purchase the land, use it for something, whatever they want to use it for. Or they could demolish the building, free up the land, put a few more homes or put a small park there. Whatever you want to do, you're free to do it. Nobody can push you off your land because you're not paying property tax anymore, not in the traditional sense. 
you have sufficient funds to take care of your necessities and very possibly you're going to have more than enough funds to treat yourself or certain members of your your street who are involved in the neighbor street bank account to something special something extra mr rodriguez is running a, a landscaping business from his home and he's got a Dodge truck and it's really taken a beating. You buy him a new Dodge Ram pickup truck. You are now really a community of neighbors. You couldn't be a community of neighbors to 55,000 people. It just isn't possible. But to 100 to 150 people, 37 homes on one street, or 20, 40, 60 homes on one or two streets combined, that you can do. Now you're getting involved in getting to know your neighbors. Now you have a mutual interest and you have a mutual interest that can be met, wants and needs can be met, because you have the financial power in the Neighbor Street bank account to make things happen. You don't have to apply to town hall. You're not paying for politicians. You don't have to worry about waste, fraud, or abuse. anything you want to do, especially after that 20 year period, when the account is covering all of your expenses and continuing to grow, gives you this freedom, a liberty, a little bit more freedom and liberty and independence to compensate for those slight infringements you may have had to agree to in an ever growing country to fulfill your responsibility to society in general. The Neighbor's Street or the Neighbor's Treat bank account idea, I think it's a very good idea that should be looked into. I believe it'll work. I believe the community can exist as a consortium of separate streets or a group of two or more streets, multiple times, many times over throughout the community, without having to rely upon a centralized government that never seems to be able to quite be able to make things work within a budget. Your budget is your own. Your street is your own. Your personal home and the property it resides upon is yours. And you only have to deal with your neighbors, no one else, to live and to prosper on your little patch of free American soil.